So this argument by design more or less says the beauty we observe around us suggests the existence of a designer. In the same way when I look at a beautiful picture, it suggests the existence of an artist who created that picture. And you can see how the logic plays out here. Uh, now I want to first mention that this particular argument takes the form of an argument by analogy. And if you ever take a logic and critical thinking class, you will learn that structure or format. An argument by analogy takes two things and connects them by an analogy, and then says, well, if they share this one thing, they probably share something else as well. You know, for example, I might say, um, these two uh, people are sisters, and one is a Christian, so the other one's probably a Christian too. Now notice that um, she, the other sister might not be a Christian, but if they are both sisters, it increases the probability that they are, share the same religion, right? Especially if they grew up in the same household. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this argument is actually inductive, it's not deductive. So we're not dealing with the same structure of logic as the previous argument, which said that if these claims are true, the conclusion is certain. In this case, we're making an analogy. We're saying this is kind of like this, this is true, so this is probably true. So the conclusion is more based on probability, on the likelihood that there is a God. So a little different argumentative structure here. So the first thing this argument does is it says, the world is like a machine. And what that means is that, and that might be even better stated, that the universe is like a machine. What that means is that a universe, the universe has order and, and working parts that go together. Kind of like if you picked apart a watch and you saw that even in one of those old school like watches from the 1800s, you know, it has all those working parts in it. It has things that go together that make sense in the context of that watch. The universe is like that, right? and that's hard to deny. Uh, there are obviously natural laws, Newton's laws. Um, there are uh, equations of quantum physics that seem to be very predictive, uh, that, that have a lot of validity for helping us understand how computers work, for example. Um, so there are parts of the world that seem to behave in coherent, ordered ways. And so that's the first part of the argument. And then the second part is that, well, when humans create machines, they have a plan right, of some kind. I mean, even the smallest thing like a pen or pencil, there was some design for that at the factory that then went into the creation of all those pencils that were then mass produced. Um, when somebody creates art, right, they have some sort of a plan in the back of their head, even if they start out in a more um, kind of ambiguous way, so to speak. Uh, so when humans create stuff, especially machines, we have a plan. Right? This camera that I'm staring into, clearly there was a plan uh, behind the design of, the, of that camera. And so the argument then makes the link. It says, okay, well, we create stuff with the plan, and the world also has order and purpose, so it must have been created with a plan also. So you can see the analogy part. It's saying, well, the world is, our, our created stuff is like this, and the universe has similar features to our created stuff, so it must also have a design. Um, I won't go over it now, but it, a famous guy named William Paley uh, during the time of Darwin actually came up with what's called the watchmaker analogy, which is one of the more famous versions of this argument. So check that out if you get a chance, if it's not already clear what I'm talking about. Um, now, I wanna point out too that it's not just design, Sorry, it's not just uh, sort of order, it's also beauty. So, so there seems to be a sense of design when we look at, as in those pictures, when we look at a beautiful coast, or the butterfly's wings, or even the human eye, right? There's, or even love, the experience of love between people. That seems to suggest some sort of a design to those sorts of experiences and those sorts of things. Um, so this argument, again, is making a link, an analogy between the way we create something and have a design behind it and the way the universe is created and may have a design behind it as well. Now, as you can imagine, there have been some criticisms of this argument over the years. And um, one criticism, of course, is the same one to all these arguments, is which God are we talking about here? Uh, the argument would seem to suggest, it just says God, but it would seem to support the existence of the Muslim God, the Zoroastrian God, the Greek gods, uh, the, the Christian God, 
It's not clear that the argument proves any one particular concept of a higher being. That's where the faith would have to take over. Nevertheless, if we just think of it as sort of a monotheistic God uh, per se, and we don't associate it with any religion, um, it's a stronger argument then. But then we have to ask, let's really follow this analogy out to its ultimate conclusion. And there's a, famous, uh, arg there's a famous attack of this argument, if you will, from a guy we're going to study later in the reader named David Hume, and in a dialogue called, uh, I believe it's called Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, he mounts an argument against this uh, argument itself. He, he gives a counter-argument to this argument. Remember, a counter-argument is kind of like you, you look at and you understand the logic given to you, like what's presented there on the, on the PowerPoint, and then you give a response to that, why you think it's wrong. So a counter-argument is an argument against the first argument that was presented. Um, so the counter-argument goes like this. There's a couple. One counter-argument kind of says, okay, this argument makes a comparison between the way humans create something and the way a god may or may not have created something. And this counter-argument says, isn't that a bit presumptuous? Isn't that a bit presumptuous to say God and humans are in the same category? Um, not only that, but Hume asks, he says, we have experienced a lot of human creation. We have a lot of experience of watching people make watches, of watching people create paintings, of watching people build houses. We have zero experience of God creation. Nobody has ever seen a God create something. Right, so Hume denies that the analogy is strong enough. He says there's not a strong enough connection. We don't have experience of God creation. It's also a bit presumptuous to even compare God to a human creation. Right? We have no idea how that works. Not only that, but think about how beings are created in nature. Um, I mean, do you build your son or daughter out of Legos like a child would? No, obviously we know what happens when a child is created in nature. That's very different than the way humans create things. So if nature is any guide to how uh, the universe may have been created, for all we know, if it was created, it was created in a totally different way than the way we create something. So just to be clear, this criticism of the argument says you can't compare humans and God. You're comparing apples and pianos. They're in two totally different categories. So that's Hume's first criticism. Secondly, he says, what happens if we actually accept the logic that they're connected? What if we accept that human creation is like God creation? Well then, it's not clear that the conclusion of the argument wouldn't be polytheism. Because think about it, when humans create stuff, is it always just kind of the starving artist in his studio painting on a canvas? No, sometimes it is. But a lot of times when humans create stuff, especially machines, which the argument compares it to, um, there is an assembly line of workers. There are a number of different people involved in the creation of it. Let's just take a car or a computer. There's going to be the higher level thinkers who are, who are actually putting out the blueprints and so forth. There's going to be the higher level managers who are implementing particular parts of the blueprint. There are going to be the workers on the assembly line who are you know, putting on the car doors and so forth. There's going to be the machines involved that are actually, you know, as we become increasingly um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As, as machines increasingly take over our, our workforce. Anyways, the point is, when we create something, especially something complicated, there's a lot of people involved. So if this argument makes a comparison between how we create and how God may have created, would that not suggest that it's many gods that exist rather than a single monotheistic god? That's what Hume said. So when Hume criticizes this argument, he says, the conclusion would suggest that we create, uh, uh, that, that the creation of the universe was more of a polytheistic, like Zeus and Athena type thing going on. The other thing Hume says is he says, let's think about what else happens when people create. We mess up. We make mistakes. There's the uh, proverbial image of the guy writing down, you know, the writer writing his, his uh, story and then crumpling up the paper and throwing it away and then starting again and crumpling that up and throwing it away. If God creates like that, what if we're in a crappy universe that he threw away, right? What if, what if that's the reason we suffer is all he had to do was dial up the, the suffering knob or dial down the suffering knob a little bit and he just messed up on our universe. 
What if we're living in a universe that's crappily designed, so to speak? So because of all this, Hume rejects the argument. He says, look, and by the way, as we'll talk about later, Hume was an agnostic. He said, I'm not saying God doesn't exist. He just said, this argument doesn't prove that. This argument doesn't establish that. So anyways, that's the criticism of the argument by design. Now, I want to point out that there have been some interesting, more robust, newer arguments by design um, that focus in on, um, you know, like, for instance, what if our universe was designed by an incredibly uh, complicated alien being who had evolved somewhere in some other universe? Now, that would still wouldn't answer the question of where that being came from, but it would answer the question of how we got designed. So in other words, the argument by design becomes stronger for some people if we consider it to be designed, to, if we consider God to be just a highly evolved being, um, not unlike ourselves, but just further advanced. Uh, you know, kind of like, kind of more like us playing The Sims, for instance. Um, anyways, I, I don't want to suggest that this argument is, you know, has been disproven by Hume. It's been revamped many times, and there's a lot of interesting versions of it out there, uh, and I encourage you to follow up on those.